All right, guys, welcome back. Um, today we're looking at positive deviance, which is Unit 2, Area Study 1, Key Knowledge 5. So it's a theory, which is a relatively new theory, which looks at, um, yeah, the positive impacts of um, deviance. How could you could, this is very much a discussion of negative deviance, which we've been discussing right up until now, apart from a bit of um, uh, Durkheim. But uh, this theory really concentrates on the positive side of deviance and its impacts on society. So, theory of positive deviance. It really takes a new approach to the study of deviance because, and it is often controversial and it's often contested in sociology simply because like anything else that actually is different from what is accepted and what the status quo actually is, it really challenges the traditional thinking of uh, what is deviance in sociology. It is similar to labelling, it, it actually involves a process, so it's already explained deviance in society so it's involves yeah so basically it's a case of well, these people become positively deviant through and it's a social construct like a lot of different things are but it's very similar there's a process to actually enable someone to be a positive deviant okay so positive deviance argues that traditional theory really focus upon negative acts and it actually ignores positive acts which can also be seen as deviant like i said deviance can encourage social change so it's not until after the fact, until the deviance is actually then seen as the right way of doing things, that we see it as positive. Because traditionally, anything that is deviant is seen as negative. But for the theory of positive deviance looks at those who have engaged in positive deviant acts or trying to make society better, and really wants to highlight their contributions to society to demonstrate that not all deviance, um, as traditional theory would suggest, is actually a negative one. It pays little attention to positive people, your yeah, inspirational leaders, those who have been uh, responsible for much social change. So this really, this theory of positive deviance is really trying to address that. Those who commit positive acts of deviance, or a study of those who have been positive acts of deviance, would lead to a better understanding of these types of people and broaden the discourse or discussion surrounding deviance in general. So we should actually, as sociologists, sociology students, as society, look at those who actually um, make or partake in positive acts of deviance and wonder why they actually do that. So then we can better understand them, so hopefully we can look at what their behaviour is and try and model that in some way, shape or form. Alright, positive acts of deviance occur when individual, wow, sorry, didn't spell check, the individual group behaves above the expected norms of a society or culture. It's basically both the theorists, the theory suggests that what can be put, deviant acts can be categorized. It's five with a new potential category, the X deviant category at the end. So the five main ones, altruism, charisma, innovation, supraconformity, innate characteristics, or the new category of X deviant. And we'll briefly discuss these. I'm gonna, as always, I'm gonna um, circulate the PowerPoint presentation. This has got a lot of links to some of the people or some of the, uh, the yeah, mainly people that I'm giving as examples uh, throughout this PowerPoint presentation that you can spend some time actually looking at. I know um, period one and two tomorrow is when we will be um, covering this stuff, but I thought it's a good idea anyway to, you can spend some time if you're reviewing this to go over so you've got examples to discuss in any assessment that you might have. All right, altruism. So this refers to an action that is performed to help a person or a group. It is done voluntarily without need for reward or acknowledgement. So just for just because it's the right thing to do or it's actually just out of the goodness of your heart. Those would be the phrases you should often um, equate to altruism. So it is purely for the benefit of others. You get no reward or recognition. So there's no money in return. There's no gifts. You're doing it because for the benefit of other people. It is different to normal altruism. It's not the same as a charitable donation or giving up your seat on the bus. It's more looking at saints, Fred Hollis. So people are sacrificing big parts of their lives for the benefit of others. That's what altruism actually is. It's not just the simple acts of uh, opening the door for someone or whatever it might actually be. Saints, not um, so saints in uh, religious history, and also Fred, people like Fred Hollis. There's lots of different examples of people who have lived an altruistic life. Fred Hollis is a good example. Click on the link, really short flip clip on um, who Fred Hollows was, and you can understand why he would be considered altruistic. All right, next, charisma. 
So someone who has unique personal characteristics which set them apart from the everyday person is said to have charisma. These people are usually naturally leaders and they're highly regarded by members of society. They're, the conditions that need to be continue to exist for charisma to be, to be used or seen as a positive, or people who are charismatic to be seen as a positive deviant is the group wants to be led and the leader wants to and is able to realize the objectives of the group. So not only the group wants to be led, so they need or want someone who can lead them and help them achieve their goals, but the leader has the characteristics inside of them, the, the unique characteristics, to actually be able to realize the objectives of the group. Gandhi, Jesus, Martin Luther King, Stephen Biko, all good examples. And you can go into detail. There's some various lengths of clips for um, these different individuals. Go through, have a look. Have a, there's some really interesting stuff about people you might not have ever heard of or had it ever come across. So I strongly recommend go through the links, put the, um, spend the time to do it. Um, you might, yeah, learn something really interesting about different people. Okay, innovation. So the combining of already existing cultural elements in a novel manner or the modifying of already existing cultural elements to produce a new one, that's known as innovation. Can occur in any area, arts, science, food, technology, or there's no limit to the scope in which innovation could actually occur. Think Steve Jobs, as we've been looking at iPod and iPad. Think Freud, the psychoanalysis, that was really an innovator. Think Blumenthal, um, in his cooking now. As I've said, I don't know who he was, so I had to look him up. But it turns out he's very much considered an innovator in um, food, restauranting, that type of thing. So check him out as well. The thing with it, you need to note about innovators is they initially can actually be seen as agitators. As remember, anyone who is trying to innovate or change from the status quo is saying that they can do things better, which is obviously going to put some offside. They, these people initially can actually be seen as people who go against the norms of society at a time. And it might not actually be until years after that the genius of their work can be realised. Van Gogh is a great example of that. His art actually didn't actually get famous and realised for what it was until a uh, long time after his death. So it does take time for these innovators to actually, for their potential and what they're trying to do for it actually to be realised. All right, supra conformity. Easy, think straight A students. Their behavior is at a level that is idolized by a culture or so. Wow, that's what I want to do. That is awesome, that is impressive. So this part of the positive deviance theory looks at, it really says norms can operate on two different levels. The ideal. So most people believe, but is that like everyone would love to be, that's, well, it's in a per idolized society that people are achieving straight A's, but many, few, very, very few people actually achieve that. So therefore, that there's the ideal, and then there's the realistic that most people can achieve. Do the right thing, cross the street at the lights, put your rubbish in the bin, that's what we can do. But the straight A, never get a parking ticket, never get a speeding fine, always pays their bills on time, that's really the idealised level of society. A negative deviant, as we've discussed in a lot of detail in previous classes, they don't make either of these levels. So super conformity looks at the absolute people who we really think we idealise as, well, we want to be like them. So... They demonstrate a desire and ability to shoot that which is idealized. They want to be the best at what they do. Think Messi, Usain Bolt, Don Bradman in sport, Don Bradman in sporting context. I haven't included links to those people. Easy to look up clips from all three different. Uh, Messi is a soccer player, Usain Bolt a sprinter, Don Bradman was a cricketer um, in Australia's history, one of the best cricketers throughout world history. Okay, innate characteristics. So these people demonstrate positive deviance because they possess natural traits such as intelligence, beauty, or talent. These are traits which are considered import, um, important to be important. Nice, I actually mean important by society, by a culture or a group. I'm going to change that, obviously, after the video. So think Megan Gale, right? She couldn't actually, as a if you don't know Megan Gale, Google her. She was a model, but she couldn't actually break through in Australia because her beauty or the, what makes her beautiful was not seen as important here in Australia. She had um, uh, fuller figure, dark hair, and when she, she went to Italy, her natural traits were considered to be a lot more important, so this, she actually became a famous model by being in Italy, and then she became well-known internationally. So 
Yes, her beauty was self-evident as far as Australia is concerned. Again, we still as a society consider beauty to be um, important, but it wasn't until she went to Italy, it was actually seen as more important than she got recognised throughout the world. There's this new type, an ex-deviant. The previously stigmatised person labelled in a negative fashion that manages to convert to a status of a normative person becomes a positive deviant, which is actually really funny because you get seen as a deviant by being like a crim, you ex-con or whatever you want to call it. But when you actually convert and you're now back to a normative or normal person, you are seen as a positive deviant because not many people do. Many people stay stuck, stay stuck in that stigma or in that particular role. So that's why if you make that change, the X deviant, it's actually seen as a positive deviant because most people don't. That's the last category that theory looks at in terms of positive change. All right, so that's basically it. I've also included, I was including a Zuno message, this PowerPoint presentation after I make a number of changes. I'll include the theory. It's only eight pages. It's a good document to actually have. Uh, let me see, I will, if that allows me to. Yep, excellent, I'll just show you what I'm talking about. Uh, where is it? Here, eight pages of notes, which really supports, as you can see, uh, examples of positive classificatory model, goes through all the de detail there, which you can read through um, at your leisure. All right, so tomorrow we'll finish off the Steve Jobs video. We'll have a look at a few different uh, exercises where we can demonstrate or apply the theory of positive deviance. Sorry, a bit later than normal. Hope you all get to watch it, and I'll see you in class. Bye-bye.